phone rang almost as soon as we reached the dollar spot at Target. To my sisters and I, it's church. We make weekly, sometimes multi-weekly trips to Target. It's a bright, orderly place that I happily contribute five to 20% of my annual salary to. <laughs> it's cleaner than Walmart, it has a Starbucks, and I just really like those red carts. <laughs> How dare someone bother me here now, in the middle of worship? <laughs> but I kept the ringer on a lot more lately. There seemed to be a lot more phone calls since mom died. I walked over to the little cafe, unnerved by the smell of popcorn, and the hum of the Coke machine. I took a seat in the small, in the farthest corner of a little red white booth, my aunt and my sisters following me. No one was around except for the teenager tending the icing machine. He looked up but ignored me when he realized all I wanted was to use his dirty table. The man on the phone was from the life sharing organization, who was in charge of harvesting organs, mom's organs. My aunt saw my ashen face and asked to take over the phone call for me. Honestly, she might have had the answers he needed, but I shook my head. My parents never married, and I am my mother's oldest daughter. I am the next of kin. The task to give her medical history fell to me. I was strangely proud of my role. Uh, I was going to brave little toaster my way through this phone call. I insisted that this was my job. I didn't even know these phone calls existed. The majority of my medical experience comes from a teenage obsession with ER and I don't remember Dr. Carter calling any patient's partners to ask if they did anal. <laughs> Nevertheless, this was a legitimate concern I was expected to address. There wasn't a formal introduction. The man on the phone seemed to just launch right in. Was the deceased a drug user? Yes. I chewed my lip as I spoke, my eyes searching for my sisters who'd abandoned me in the popcorn-scented prison and onto the junior's department. What kind? I liked him instantly for his matter-of-fact tone. He wasn't as condescendingly pleasant as the surgeons I'd had experience with. I paused. There was a difference between knowing the truth and knowing the whole story. Um, pot and meth? Any cocaine? Heroin? He asked without a hint that he was speaking to the child of, whose mother just died. She was only 46, a whole year older than her father when he had died. Aneurysm, not alcoholism. I don't know. I wanted to sound as unaffected as he did, like this was an expected phone call. Maybe cocaine? The question hung in the air as I searched my memories for the street lingo I'd learned through D.A.R.E. and several very special episodes of syndicated comedy, and if I'd ever heard her use them. Late at night as she sat up meticulously cleaning the stove, or in her often violent arguments with my dad. Maybe. I wish I had something to do with my hands. The popcorn smell that wafted over Target was calling to me, but I thought it would sound, I thought the sound of my chewing would sound worse than my silence over the phone. <laughs> Besides, my purse was in the cart with my sisters, whom I can no longer see from the cafe. The man on the phone asked if it was okay for them to use her eyes for corneal replacement. I didn't answer right away, momentarily astonished that this was an option. I teared up as I explained how terrible her eyesight was. As much as I tried to separate her from the body, it was still her. There was never a question of donating her organs. When she was in the hospital, it was the only thing I definitely knew the answer to. Everything about my mother dying was brand new, and yet I still somehow felt like I was supposed to know what I was doing. I had seen steel magnolias. I knew I was supposed to power my way through my, with my wit. I was the big sister. I was the next of kin. I needed to set the tone. I worried if the drugs would make her unworthy. How ravaged had her organs been from years of cigarette smoke and chemical dependence? The man on the phone asked me if she had diseases, cancer, HIV, AIDS, and I felt like they must already know that. They must have standard blood tests. Were they trying to catch me lying? He rattled off the questions. Did she have a lot of sexual partners? I don't know. Did she have sex with men who had sex with other men? I don't think so. Did she have anal sex? I mean, I, I don't. <laughs> the man on the phone laughed. Imagine asking an 80-year-old woman if her 82-year-old husband slept with other dudes. <laughs> I laughed, too. What else do you do in that situation? In the Grief Olympics, 80-year-old ladies won the gold, and dead moms were a distant bronze. Old people are already tragic in life. 
In death, they're heroes and grandpas. I answered as well as I could, but the more he asked questions, the more I began to feel like I didn't know my mother. I knew her as mom. With skin hairless and Indian, and soft as a newborn's, a perfectionist who dreamed of being a surgical nurse. If only she hadn't had me, and my sister, and my other sister. <laughs> she was a certified nurse's assistant, which means she wiped your grandma's butt when your mom dumped her off in some terrible place called Pleasant Manor. <laughs> but no amount of sponge bathing or temperature taking dulled her compassion. She always wanted to be a nurse, not for the salary or the prestige, but because she cared about people. Most of all, she wanted better for her children. It was six years before I had another sister, and all six were packed with moments where I was her only daughter. As her firstborn, I knew when the electricity hadn't been paid, and we had to go to the MAC project to get assistance. I shared the embarrassment when food had to be put back at the grocery store, when the food stamps didn't stretch that far. It was me who insisted my baby sister have our last name, my mother's last name, so I wouldn't be the only one. She used to call me her number one, because we were Star Trek fans, I knew that meant I was the Lieutenant Will Riker to her Captain Jean-Luc Picard. <laughs> but I was still her daughter and not her friend. Oldest daughters of unmarried den women have to do a lot of things their sisters never had to suffer, like answer questions about her mom's medical history in the middle of Target. The red plastic chair was sticking to my legs and my eyes were glued to the small pile of trash near the bottom of a table. I wish this wasn't my job. I wish I just let my aunt take over. The telephone, go, telephone guy wrapped up the phone call with a sincere thank you on behalf of Life Sharing, a member of UNOS. For those who are not obsessed with ER, UNOS is the United Network for Organ Sharing. It's kind of cute how they call it sharing, as if heart valves and kidneys were not unlike crayons in kindergarten, as if someone usually didn't have to die before sharing it with the next person. After I ended the phone call, I pulled myself off the plastic chair to find my sisters and my aunt. My aunt asked if it was all okay, and I said yes, because it had to be. This was just going to be life from now on, invasive phone calls and in between regular visits at Target. I helped my sister pick out a skirt and wipe the phone call from my mind. We had a memorial service the following week, and she was cremated. She is still on the shelf in my apartment. I didn't want the urn, but we really didn't know where to put it. It's gold and mother of pearl, and it doesn't match any of my decor. Sometimes when I'm looking at it and thinking about how ugly it is, I wonder if she's thinking about me too. Is there some great beyond like we're shown in literature? Death is always supposed to have so much meaning, but now that I get to experience it firsthand, I know that there's no meaning in death. It just sucks. More than a year later, I received a letter from the Life Sharing Organization. They'd sent a thank you note before, and invited me to some event for survivors, as if I wanted to go hang out with Miss 80-year-old. Would we talk about our phone calls over cheese and crackers? I wanted no part of it. I did and do feel very strongly about organ donation, but like most aspects of grief, it all came across as overreaching, disingenuous, or schmaltzy. The worst part of grief is the way everyone asks you if you're okay, as if they don't know how not okay loss is. I told a friend how I was mad at every person that had a mother that was alive, and she seemed shocked and gassed in this scolding way that made me retreat into my skin. I didn't know how to describe the feeling to anyone. Sure, I had my little sisters, but death was still new. It was like all the movies said, but completely opposite. They got the sadness right, but the bizarre and the hilarious and the heartbreaking were missing. I wasn't interested in this letter. I left it unopened for a few days, and when I finally opened it, I was disappointed to find a short form letter. They didn't even write a real letter, and they misspelled her name. Worse, I find out that they, this anonymous person, received cartilage from her knee to fix an ACL injury. I felt cheated. I hope for a kidney, maybe. What a stupid fucking sacrifice. My mom died. She was going to die anyway. But she died, and all I had to show for it was Mrs. Anonymous and her torn ACL. I imagine that my mother's organs had saved someone's life. The TV narrative is always about someone struggling on life support, 
and little igloo coolers being rushed across the country via helicopter. I guess cells for healing knees don't boost the ratings. I quickly folded the letter and shoved it into a drawer to be forgotten. I wish I hadn't gotten one at all. I don't care about your fill-in-the-blank letter or your knee. I was still in the anger portion of the Kubler-Ross's grief cycle. When I think about my mom and her work as a nurse, her life, I think about how she was everyone's mom. All her patients were in their convalescence. They were near the end of their lives, but she still had meaningful conversations with them. She still treated them like human beings, not discarded people. She was patient with their dementia and respectful of their dignity as she helped feed or diaper them. She accepted their meager gifts of hospital socks and she gave them Christmas cards. She wouldn't feel cheated by helping someone with a torn ACL. She'd be grateful to have helped them any way she could. I thought this letter was going to give me the depth that I so desperately wanted from her life being cut short. But there was never going to be some meaning in her death, except that it just is, and it sucks. I look at that ugly urn almost every day, and it only reminds me that she's not in there. She's everywhere. That was Asha Galindo.